Side Chapter 22 The Fifteen Evil Breaking Swords and the Sixth Reincarnated Individual The Fifteen Evil Breaking Swords, a secret fighting force prided by the Amid Empire, comprised of warriors who possessed the highest skill in combat. They were feared beings who were rumored to have used their power to turn the tides of numerous battles, stop monster rampages on their own and erase traitors to the nation, pulling out any roots of rebellion. If one considered the S-Class adventurer, the Thunderclap Schneider and his party to be the greatest fighting force that didn't belong to the Empire's government, the Fifteen Evil Breaking Swords were the greatest fighting force that did. This is an unpleasant mission, muttered the Lightspeed Sword Rickard Amid, who belonged to the Fifteen Evil Breaking Swords and had been assigned the number three, as he continued down the highway towards his mission. Despite being as young as being in his late twenties, the third sword was such a master of the blade that he was said to be faster than light. In fact, his abilities were equivalent to those of an A-class adventurer. He was a handsome man with a shapely nose. While he was a member of a secret force, he was highly popular among the ladies of the upper class, there were endless marriage talks despite the fact that he was already married to three wives. He even came from an excellent bloodline, he was the grandson of the previous emperor of the Amid Empire, with the current emperor Marshiksarl being Rickard's uncle. As an honorary duke, he owned no land, but he had received offers of recommendations to become the first sword in the future, and he was in a position where his name would certainly be among the candidates to become the next emperor if something were to happen to Marshiksarl and the newly born first prince. But Rickert knew that all of these were lies. His sword was slower than light. He had simply been chosen as a decoration among the fifteen evil breaking swords because of his good looks and heritage. The position of third sword and the position of first sword that he had been promised were simply for propaganda. And nothing would happen to Marshiksarl during his lifetime. That was how things had been up until today, and things wouldn't change from tomorrow onwards. Is it unpleasant? asked Bus, Rickert's attendant. The stable ruling of the former Sauron region is currently the greatest unresolved problem in the empire. The outcome of the war against the Orbom kingdom depends on it. If you can suppress things, my lord, your achievements will echo across the entire empire. The fifteen evil breaking swords were a secret force, but Rickard's existence itself was an advertisement sign that displayed the empire's military strength. Thus, a carriage was used to transport him to places and he was constantly accompanied by knights wearing gaudy armor and bus, who was his attendant and essentially his secretary. Rickert was inside a carriage so extravagant that if he were to tell someone that he was going to a ball rather than to a mission, nobody would have doubted him. How can I be happy over being praised for a hollow achievement gained through something that is disguised as a mission, he said with a sigh, his words dripping with sarcasm. My lord, you will be heard from outside. If you wish to complain, you must inform me in advance, said Bus, remonstrating his master as he activated a magic item that prevented sound from extending past a certain area, allowing private conversations. I did put thought into that. The armor and helmets that our empire provides to the knights that guard us have too many decorations, so those sounds are very loud. They can't hear my complaints as they're walking. You're wasting your magic stones, Rickert said. Putting thought into things is my duty, Bus said, thinking now more than usual that his lord had some kind of serious illness. What exactly is it that you find unpleasant, he asked, pressing his master to spit out all of his complaints. Bus thought that it was also his duty to listen to such complaints. Knowing that Bus thought this, Rickard spat out his complaints and the stress that had accumulated in his chest like sediment. What, you ask? It's the same as always. My own lack of talent that causes me to always be used as a decoration, while being fully aware of the reality of the situation. Apparently, those with sharp senses think that this incident was a ploy of His Majesty's to reduce the influence of the useless Duke Marm. Duke Marm, who had been complaining that the rule of the former Sauron region was not going well, had been successfully deceived and placed in a position as the person now responsible for and in charge of the occupying army that would likely fail at their job. 
and by offering a helping hand at the timing when Duke Marm would begin complaining it would become widely known that his ability for ruling and military strategy was worthless, thus lowering the power of the Marm family of dukes. The discord between Emperor Marshiksarl and Duke Marm was famous enough to be known to any who were reasonably knowledgeable regarding matters within the empire. And any half-clever nobles could imagine that it was impossible for Duke Marm to rule the occupied land of an enemy nation. And so, many thought that there was a power struggle going on between the Emperor and Duke Marm behind the scenes of Rickard and the other fifteen evil breaking swords being sent out. Indeed, it was possible that Marshiksarl did have such intents. But His Majesty's true aim isn't to wear away at Duke Marm's influence. The mission given to us isn't the extermination of the resistance either, said Rickert. We're to make contact and negotiate with the damper Vandalieu, who slaughtered the Mergshield Nation's expedition army of 6,000 and went on a rampage in the Orbom Kingdom as well. If the negotiations break down, we're to dispose of him. Marshuksarl was after Vandalieu. Marshuksarl, who had gathered information through a different network to the one used by the army occupying the Sauron region, knew that the resistance organization known as the Sauron Liberation Front had made contact with the ghouls of the Sauron region. And by adding together and analyzing other small pieces of information, he had become certain that Vandalieu was backing the Sauron Liberation Front. That was why he had appointed Duke Marm as the new supreme commander of the army occupying the region so that he could use him as a touchstone and bait for determining how hostile Vandalieu was towards the empire. Duke Marm was someone with the blood of the imperial family, with rights to succeed the throne, and even among the empire's noblemen, he discriminated against Vita's races particularly harshly. On top of that, he was a passionate believer of Alda. And to Marshiksarl, he wasn't someone who would be considered a loss if he was killed. Even if Duke Marm and the vassals that he had taken with him were to be killed, there were people who could succeed them, so there wouldn't be any great harm to his region's economy. The other noblemen who had moved with the Duke were those that the Emperor felt could be replaced or simply didn't care about if they were absent. In truth, Duke Marm had yielded and asked for the fifteen evil breaking swords to be dispatched sooner than Marshiksarl expected, but even if that hadn't happened, Rickard and the others would likely have been dispatched anyway in order to deal with Vandalieu. But are His Majesty's decisions not the natural decisions to make? At the age of six, the Damper slaughtered 6,000 elite troops from the Mergshield Nation as well as the vampire hunter Bormac Gordon and even turned them into undead to perform a counter-invasion, where he turned the cultivated land into a rotten sea of deadly poison, said Bus. In addition to that, in the Hartner Duchy of the Orbom Kingdom, he tilted a castle, destroyed a mine operated by slaves along with the entire mountain, buried a knight's order and kidnapped over a thousand villagers and disappeared somewhere. And he is manipulating the Scylla race and the resistance from behind the scenes. To be frank, all of this is difficult to believe. On top of all of that, according to the information, Vandalieu was capable of creating new dungeons. Immediately after a damper thought to be Vandalieu was sighted in the city of Niarchy in the Hartner Duchy, a dungeon had appeared in the forest to the direction in which Vandalieu had fled the city. After that, many dungeons had been discovered in the Hartner Duchy. Other than the one discovered close to the city of Niarchy, they were all F-class dungeons with only a single floor consisting of a single room, however. Thus, it's not that I'm dissatisfied with being sent out to hunt one damper child. Even if we ignore the unconfirmed information that you just mentioned, he's someone that many ghouls and undead obey. If all of the unconfirmed information is true on top of that, he's so dangerous that he won't be a problem of just the Sauron duchy, said Rickert. If we don't deal with him right, in the worst-case scenario, the Amid Empire could be destroyed. My lord, you must not say such careless things. It's not careless, bus. It's unknown as to how much fighting strength Vandalieu possesses as an individual, but he destroyed an elite force of 6,000 of the Mergshield Nation's elite three years ago. We should consider him to be capable of destroying at least one of our vassal nations, including the Mergshield Nation.
and unless the Orbom kingdom's power is severely harmed, it's clear that they'll come to take advantage of that as well. The Amid Empire's vassal nations, the maritime nation of Kalahad to the south, the mountain nation of Marmyuk to the north, the Grey Nation of Yond to the west and to the east, the Merkshield nation that possessed the greatest military strength among them all. The army of elite individuals from the Merkshield nation had been unable to defeat Vandalyu. If he were to set his eyes on one of the other three nations, in the worst-case scenario, the damage would be so great that they would stop functioning as nations. Vandalyu was capable of contaminating the earth with a poison that lingered for a long period of time, it was unknown as to what methods he used to create that poison, but if it was possible for him to spread that poison across large areas of land or ocean, he could destroy nations without even having to fight them. Marshiksarl would be a failure of an emperor if he were to not pay attention to such a dangerous individual. But my lord, making contact and negotiating with this Vandalyu is part of our mission. I find it difficult to imagine that the negotiations will go well, said Bus. Really? Actually, I feel the same way, said Rickert. My lord. That's what I personally think. But it seems that His Majesty and the others of the Fifteen Swords have ideas. Considering the things that Vandalyu had done in the Mergshield nation, it was certain that he didn't have any favorable thoughts towards the Amid Empire that governed it. Considering that he was a damper, it was only natural to think that it would be impossible to build a friendly relationship. In fact, wasn't it more likely that he would curry favor with the Orbom Kingdom, a nation that was the Amid Empire's enemy? At first, that was what Rickert had thought. However, based on the various incidents in the Hartner Duchy thought to be caused by Vandalyu, Marshiksarl and his advisors had concluded that Vandalyu would not join the Orbom Kingdom's side without conditions. With that being the case, it would be possible to make him an ally, depending on the conditions. That was what they seemed to think. In fact, even in the Sauron region, Vandalyu hadn't directly caused large harm to the army occupying the area. It seemed that he had destroyed a fort, but considering the things that he had done up until now, he should have been able to destroy the entire army. Around the same period of time, the higher-ranking members of the reborn Sauron Duchy army had been destroyed, its remainders being absorbed by the Sauron Liberation Front to form a single large organization led by the liberating Princess Knight. If this was Vandalia's handiwork, the one that he had inflicted harm upon was actually the Orbom Kingdom. Based on his actions up until now, it seems that the damper named Vandalia doesn't intend to side with either the Amid Empire or the Orbom Kingdom. The emperor likely thought that he intends to build his own power made up of undead. It does indeed seem like the kind of thing that a child who possesses power would think of, said Rickert. Vandalyu would rule over a group of puppets that would work for him loyally without disobeying or having any opinion at all. The Tyrant of a Small Hill A game played with dangerous dolls, said Bus. Such a person would never yield to the empire no matter what conditions are offered, would he? That's what I think, but I'm not in charge of the negotiations, said Rickert. That's right, Ricky boy, said a new voice that suddenly echoed inside the carriage. Rickert showed no signs of surprise, but responded in a sour voice. Five-headed snake Dono. Could I ask you to stop calling me that? This was the five-headed snake Irvine, the fifth sword, a true member of the fifteen evil-breaking swords. He was a man who had already been a member of the fifteen evil-breaking swords by the time Rickert joined them. Irvine chuckled. What else would you have me call a youngster who has not even lived a hundred years if not boy? Irvine Sama, I believe that my lord is more displeased by your nickname of Ricky, said Bus. Ah, oh, I see. My apologies, I'll call you something else if I remember. Incidentally, it is the seventh time that I have heard those words. Oh my, is that so? I'm sorry, Ricky boy, Irvine said, speaking to Rickert once more in a disagreeable tone. I'm very forgetful, you see. After all, I am an old geezer, as you like to call me. Going on and on about something that happened years ago. An unpleasant man as usual. 
Rickard thought. Immediately after Rickard joined the fifteen evil breaking swords, he had met Irvine on a mission. On that occasion, Irvine had been acting in an unpleasant senpai-like manner, and Rickard had once called him Old Geezer. It seemed that Irvine still held a grudge towards Rickard for that. Now then, back to the topic, Ricky, Irvine said. Your duty is your mission on the surface, acting as the cool, strong hero that eliminates the resistance. We'll have you work up until a certain point, and if the negotiations with the Vandal you brat break down, you and I, along with the others, will dispose of him. The others? You are not the only one? Rickard asked. I'm honored that you think so highly of me, but even I am not enough to face thousands of undead. If he hunts down the dimlets of the occupying army, they could all be killed and turned into undead. Each of the fifteen evil breaking swords, particularly the true members like Irvine, possess the strength to fight over a thousand enemies at once. However, no matter how powerful they were, they would always be fighting from a disadvantageous position if they were facing large numbers of enemies. In this mission, they had to force Bandalyu, who was likely hiding behind the Sauron Liberation Front, to the surface to negotiate with him and then dispose of him if the negotiations failed. It seemed that the Emperor and the Zero Sword, the leader of the Fifteen Evil Breaking Swords, had decided that it would be too dangerous for anyone to chase Bandalyu on their own if he left the Sauron Liberation Front to die and refused to come out, or tried to flee after negotiations broke down without fighting. Me and two others, Irvine said. The insect swarm Babeket, the fifteenth sword, and the king slayer Slagar, the eleventh sword, are participating. Wait, why are you telling me that? Rickard asked. Because Rickard was merely a decoration to be shown off to society, he didn't have detailed information on the true members of the fifteen evil breaking swords, including Irvine. Irvine was the only one whose name and face he knew, and as for the other true members, he had only heard the titles that the emperor had given them, which were almost like code names. Rickert found it strange that Irvine would go out of his way to reveal their names. Of course, it's because you'll meet them on site, Irvine replied. With this mission, there is almost no information that we can gather preemptively. We can't scout from the sky, and even when people were sent in directly, they went missing. I knew that Duke Marm's army's reconnaissance didn't go well, but what about the Hilt guys? Rickard asked. Among the fifteen evil breaking swords, there were some members originating from the Hilt, which was comprised of capable covert operatives and spies. At the very least, they should have been more competent than Duke Marm's soldiers. Ah. After sending information that there are strange stone monuments, they all went missing, said Irvine. That's why we're going to conduct a power search once we arrive on site. Either way, if we capture, interrogate and kill resistance members or ghouls, the mastermind or someone who knows him will come out eventually. Isn't it a bad idea to kill the subordinates of someone we're trying to negotiate with? Rickard asked, thinking that this would take a lot of time and effort. It's not like there are any problems with that, is it? Considering the methods that he's used so far, no matter how you look at it, he's the kind of guy who thinks of his subordinates' lives like consumable goods. Are you saying that I'm wrong, Ricky boy? Rickert closed his eyes and recalled the methods that Vandalyu had been using so far. Leaving aside the fact that he had slaughtered the expedition army, he had turned them into undead, attacked a city, and rendered the cultivated land there uninhabitable. The image of Vandalia that one could gain from all of this was one with a cold-hearted, cruel personality that didn't hesitate despite the fact that civilians could get caught up in the conflict and that the hearts of the deceased expedition army soldiers' families would be deeply tormented for a long time. No, he had likely even taken this into account and taken these actions on purpose. Considering the dungeon creation incident and the destruction of the slave run mine in the Hartner Duchy, it didn't seem that he had any compassion or mercy. And the deliberate murders of the top ranking members of the reborn Sauron Duchy army, carried out in order to increase the power of the Sauron Liberation Front, led by the liberating Princess Knight, whom he had somehow turned into his subordinate. 
Given all of these, Dandelieu didn't care if innocent lives were put at risk as long as he could erase those who opposed him, and he would use the lives of his subordinates like consumable goods, it wouldn't bother him in the slightest if they were killed. That was the kind of image that could be put together. However, there was information that didn't quite match this image. No, it's difficult to imagine that you're wrong, but... I thought there were some strange reports, said Rickert. Vandelieu had apparently assisted the cultivation villages of the Hartner Duchy, and around the time period where he appeared there frequently, there had been a mysterious phenomenon in the farming villages near where small dungeons were discovered, where the villagers were visited by Vita's clay dolls filled with valuable metals, money and food if they gave their aged livestock as an offering. And if the reason the ghouls of the Hartner Duchy had vanished like the ones in the Mergshield Nation was because Vandalieu had gathered them, then something was strange. If he wanted fighting strength, Vandalieu could create undead, so he wouldn't have needed to go out of his way to gather ghouls. Considering that, wouldn't you say that he controls the undead to use as disposable soldiers, feels no mercy and even sadistic tendencies towards his enemies? but possesses the kind of personality with enough compassion to provide charity to those he feels he should protect, said Rickert. It's exactly as if you swapped the humans and Vita's races in Duke Mom's views. That might be true. Irvine didn't even try to deny Rickert's conclusion. But either way, they're likely just accessories for him to feel pleased with himself, thinking that he's doing good things. Or maybe he's just using them and keeping them until he turns them into undead. Like fish in a tank. It's possible that the upper ranks of the Sauron Liberation Front, including the liberating Princess Knight, have already been turned into undead and the underlings are continuing to move, oblivious to it. That's true, but... And it's not like we're going to be friends with him. If we can take him in, we will, and if that seems impossible, we dispose of him. If he has precious people that can be used as a weakness, then it's actually convenient. We can use them as hostages. Ricky boy, don't you worry about it. Just lift up the liberating Princess Knight's head and think of a speech to calm the people, telling them that everything's all right thanks to His Majesty, the Great Emperor, who dispatched the fifteen evil breaking swords. And with those words, Irvine's faint presence vanished. Rickert wasn't sure whether he had left or whether he was lurking around somewhere, but either way, the conversation was already over. That old geezer, guessing all the things that I find unpleasant and then ending the conversation like that, Rickert muttered. What he found unpleasant was not the methods employed by the fifteen evil-breaking swords or the emperor's intents, but the contents of this mission that made him fully aware that he was nothing more than a decoration, through and through. Rickard's role was to carry out his official mission of eliminating the resistance and make his success clear to the occupying army, regardless of whether the negotiations with Vandalieu and his possible extermination were successful or not. Whether the liberating Princess Knight's head was the real one or a fabricated fake would depend on the negotiations with Vandalieu, however. My lord. I believe that your mission is also a necessary duty to provide the Amid Empire with a thousand years of prosperity, said Bus, offering Rickert a black tea made with water boiled by a magic item. Rickert responded with a sigh. But can Irvine Dono and the others really defeat that damper? Bus continued. It is not that I am doubting everyone's abilities, however. They probably can, Rickert replied, his shoulders relaxing as the scent of the black tea filled his nose. If what he says can be trusted, Irvine himself is capable even among the fifteen evil breaking swords. And I've heard rumors about the insect swarm and the kingslayer. Insect swarm was the only confirmed bug tamer in the empire. He had once cleared a group of monsters overflowing from the shallow layers of the Trial of Zachert, all on his own. The Kingslayer originated from the Hilt, and he had slain numerous monsters with the title of King that had been protected by hundreds or thousands of underlings. Rickard, who was an advertisement for their achievements, knew of their strength. And among all of the information that we have gathered about Vandalieu so far, there is nothing that mentions his individual fighting strength. It's likely that he's a special tamer. 
he tries to increase the number of pawns under his command because he himself is weak. His attack on the slave-run mine in the Hartner Duchy, his gathering of ghouls, Scylla and the resistance as his underlings, it's all probably for that reason. Judging from how he polluted the cultivated land, he probably has poison and disease-related ways of attacking, but if they are wary of that, then he won't even put up a fight. Rickert found this mission unpleasant, but at the very least, he wouldn't fail it. That was the kind of mission it was. The Noah Mouse Smith's cheeks relaxed as she felt the warmth of sunlight and the tickling sensation of a breeze against her skin for the first time in a long time. Even in a different world, the sun and wind aren't any different, are they? she murmured. But still, I'm really naked, am I supposed to cover myself with leaves? There was nobody else around her. Seeing that she was in a grass-covered plain, Mao decided to examine the state of her body in her third lifetime. Chestnut-colored hair and tan skin. Her height was far shorter than it had been on Earth or in origin, to put it bluntly, she was a midget. As if to compensate for that, her limbs had muscle on them. Mal curled her hands into fists several times, did jumps on the spot and tried walking and light running. Hmm, I don't have scales or a hand dynamometer so I can't tell for sure, but I get the feeling that my physical strength has increased. But considering that, my body feels heavier. I suppose that's because I chose this race, she muttered. Those who knew her from her previous life would recognize her face as having traces of its previous appearance, but it was younger overall. It might have been possible to convince them that she was a much younger sister with completely different hair, eye and skin colors. But that would be difficult in Lambda. Because she was a member of a different race. The race that Mao had chosen for her third life was the dwarf race. It wasn't that she'd wanted to be a dwarf no matter what. She had simply wanted an appearance that was as different as possible from the one that Vandalia knew. It was impossible to request for Rodcourt to simply change her face. Her physical body would be influenced by her soul that carried its memories and personality from her previous lives. It was possible to minimize that influence if she were to have been reborn as a baby like she had been in origin. But when reincarnated in a directly created adult body, it was impossible. Thus, Mao had chosen to become a dwarf rather than a human or elf. She had actually wanted Rodcourt to make her a man, but that was impossible. You know that the brain structures of men and women are different, do you not? If the body and soul do not match, there will be large effects, in the worst case scenario, you could die within several days, so I advise against it, Rodcourt had said. Of course, the inspector Shimada Izumi had confirmed that this wasn't a lie. Well, my name can't be changed in my status, and I'll be found out when I'm found out, so I don't really care. I'll get used to my body eventually. Status. Wow, it really comes out. Mel examined her own attribute values and her transformed skills. She could see her unique skills, the god of reincarnation's fortune, target radar, owner of over 100 million death attribute mana and unique skill concealment. With unique skill concealment, her unique skills wouldn't be seen by demon eyes of appraisal or when she registered at a guild. This was a modification made by learning from Keita Kanata's mistakes, thought of by Izumi and Aaron. With this, the fact that she was a reincarnated individual wouldn't be revealed, even if her status was looked at. Still, seeing my driving and piloting ability turned into mount. I was a pilot, you know. And my other skills levels aren't very high. Just what kind of monsters are the people who live in this world? Well, I'll stop the naked monologue here. Yes, yes, this way, right? Hmm, it's quite hard to walk with these short legs. Listening to Rodcourt's voice that was playing inside her head, Mal began walking. She was heading towards a small group of bandits, and she would defeat them to get clothes and other things that she needed. And by the time she was ready for her journey, she would have become a level 100 jobless, also commonly known as a commoner, from the experience points gained from killing the bandits. 
Once she continued to a nearby city, registered at a guild, received identification, fabricated a suitable background and finally went through a job change, nobody would suspect anything. She was 15 years old, a dwarf who had just become an adult, so some might think it strange at first that she hadn't possessed a job until coming to the city, but if she kept changing cities, countries and continents as she repeatedly changed jobs, she would be able to fool them. Now then, once I save enough money, I'll bid farewell to this continent and begin a business in another continent. Mal had no intention of getting involved with Vandalu whatsoever. She had no intention of trying to kill him like Murakami and the others, nor did she intend to try to convince him and stop him like Minami Asagi. She intended to flee to a place far away from Vandalu and spend her life there. That was why she had chosen to be reincarnated earlier than the others. Though she had reached out to the other reincarnated individuals, like the clairvoyants Tendu, the Ifrit Akaki and the Oracle and Dukuya, they hadn't followed her. But they had supported her. They had told her that there might be more reincarnated individuals who didn't want to fight Vandalu, and that Mao should lend them her help when the time came. Incidentally, she would be contacted by Izumi and Aaron when such individuals appeared, or in situations of emergency. Rodcourt had allowed Mao's decision. Reincarnated individuals had the role of developing Lambda as well, not just the role of killing Vandalu. One day, a dwarf adventurer by the name of Mao, who was unusually adept at wind attribute magic despite her race, would eventually come to do a little work in the Farsan Duchy of the Orbom Kingdom, which was known for its fishing and shipping industries. She would reach C-class around a year after her registration, far faster than ordinary adventurers, but soon get on a ship and journey away from the Bon Gaia continent. The Noah Mao Smith has been reincarnated in a dwarf body created by Rodcourt. Remaining Reincarnated Individuals Rodcourt's Divine Realm, 12 Origin, 79